Hello, everybody. Welcome to the first lecture of Physics 425, Low Temperature Physics. Um, just before we begin, I just want to draw your attention to the course website. And so here's the URL. All of the lecture videos that get recorded will be posted to YouTube, and the links to the videos can be found on the course website. Um, so let's just get right into it. The first topic that I want to discuss is uh, attaining low temperatures. Um, and this first topic will actually serve also as a review of some basic thermodynamics. What we're going to do to obtain our initial low temperatures is we're going to run a heat engine in reverse. So usually when you think of a heat engine, what you try to do is you try to use a temperature difference and convert that thermal energy into some useful work, like uh, rotating a spindle or something like that, turning the temperature difference into, um, for example, rotational kinetic energy. What we're going to try to do is we're going to try to do the opposite. We're going to try to do work on our system, we'll input work into the refrigerator, and we'll try to maintain, we'll try to establish and maintain a temperature difference using that work. So the abstract diagram looks something like this. We're going to have one thermal reservoir, which we'll put at temperature T2, and we'll call this the hot thermal reservoir. Uh, below that, we'll have a second thermal reservoir, and we'll call this reservoir at temperature T1. This is the cold thermal reservoir. And we would like to have T2 greater than T1. The conceptual idea is that we are going to try to do work on our system. So we'll input work, and then maybe our system is somewhere here between the two thermal reservoirs. And the goal is to keep the thermal reservoir that's cold, to keep it cold, to keep T1 at a low temperature. So we would like to extract heat, say Q1, from the reservoir at temperature T1, and then deposit heat, say Q2, into reservoir T2. So we want to take heat out of the cold reservoir and dump it into the hot reservoir. So in words, the goal is to do work W on the system. And using that work, we're going to extract heat Q1 from the cold reservoir at T1, and we'll deposit heat Q2 into the warm reservoir at temperature T2. Um, the easiest example to think of is assuming that our system is an ideal gas. So as an example, let's suppose we're working with an ideal gas. So our system is an ideal gas. Uh, so we know the equation of states, which is just the ideal gas law. And it is PV is nKBT. So P is pressure, V is volume, N is the number of particles in the system, KB is Boltzmann's constant, and T is temperature. 
Um, another useful bit of information that we'll use is that the internal energy of our ideal gas is F over 2 nKVT, where F is the number of degrees of freedom. It's the number of degrees of freedom. degrees of freedom um, of the particles in our system. So let's assume that we're working with a monotonic gas, and this is a good assumption because usually in low temperature physics, when we talk about um, refrigerator cycles, we're usually using helium as the working gas, and helium is monotonic. So for a monotonic system, F is equal to 3. The degrees of freedom are just motions in the X, Y, and Z direction. If you had something like a diatomic uh, molecule in your system, nitrogen or something like that, then you might have to worry about uh, rotational degrees of freedom. And not typically at low temperatures, but in principle, you could have also vibrational degrees of freedom. But we'll assume we have f equals 3. Okay, so the first question is, um, how can we extract Q1 from the cold reservoir? And that's the part of the cycle that's going to be important for us, taking the heat out of the cold reservoir. That's the refrigeration part and deposit Q2 into the hot reservoir. Okay, so it's gonna be uh, several steps. So the first step is uh, we're gonna to wanna to do work on our ideal gas and the way that you can do work on a gas is you can put your gas inside a piston and you can say compress it. So one way to do work on the ideal gas is to compress it with a piston. Um, in this first step, what we're going to do is we're going to do our compression isothermally at a constant temperature. And we'll do this by placing our system, our gas, in contact with one of the reservoirs. And for this step, we'll choose the hot reservoir. Okay, so what that might look like is we have our hot thermal reservoir and then we have some kind of container. Our gas is inside this container. And then there's a piston. And we're going to push down on that piston. And so here's our gas inside. OK. So let's see, what do we know? If T is constant at temperature T2, then because PV equals nkbt, n is the number of molecules or, or atoms in our gas, and so it's in an enclosed piston, so that's constant, kb is a constant, and we're doing an isothermal process, so temperature is constant. So if kbt is a constant, then we also know that pv must be equal to a constant. Or uh, p is proportional to one over the volume. Uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to plot 
all the stages of our cycle on a PV diagram. And so let's start that now. And we're going to come back to this plot a few times. So here's PV. And for an isothermal process, P is proportional to 1 over the volume. So we know approximately what a 1 over volume dependence looks like. It looks something like that. And so let's say that this is at temperature T2, and this is an isothermal line or an isotherm. And so what we're going to do is if we're compressing our system, let's suppose we start at point A and the volume has to get lower. So the volume gets lower and as we compress our gas, the pressure goes up and maybe we end over here at point B and we're going in the direction from A to B. Okay. So, so far, that's what we have in our PV diagram. Here's volume VA and VB. Okay. So, the process A to B is isothermal and it's a compression. Um, for an ideal gas, the change in the system internal energy is given by, so du is the change in, ter in internal energy. Um, it's equal to d2, uh, sorry, dq. This is any heat that is added to the system. Our system might absorb heat during some process and gain internal energy. And if our system does work, then it loses internal energy, right? It uses some of its internal energy to do whatever work that it has to do. And so this is work by the system, by the gas in our case. Okay, and so we're going to try to calculate the change in or the heat added to the system and the work done by the system for the various steps of our refrigeration cycle. Um, so for a compression, if this is the container of our gas and here's our piston at some position initially and then maybe at some short time later it's moved a distance dx, right? Maybe this is a compression. Then work is F times delta X or F dx. And we could, if we wanted to, write F over A times A times dx. And then we could identify F over A. If A represents the cross-sectional area of our piston, A is the cross-sectional area. Then F over A is the pressure. And cross-sectional area times the change in this X is just the change in volume of our gas. And so therefore, the change in work is just P dV. OK. All right. So let's try to do some of these calculations for the A to B process, which is an isothermal compression. Um, the internal energy at A, remember we said the internal energy is F over 2 NKBT. 
but our temperature is at T2 and it's an isothermal process. When we get to B, because the process is isothermal, the temperature is still T2, and so that means the change in internal energy is zero. Okay, uh, so that means if our gas was to absorb or release heat, that has to be completely offset by the work term, the DW term. So, because we're in contact with thermal reservoir at T2, at temperature T2, we'll call whatever the heat is added or released by the gas um, Q2. So dQ2 is equal to dW, and we just said dW had to be PdV, and so therefore if we integrate, that's the integral of PdV, but from the ideal gas law, P is nKBT divided by V, so we have nKB, we're at temperature T2, we're going to go from the volume initially at VA to VB, and we have dV over V, and if we integrate and take care of our limits of integration, we end up with something that is the ln of the volume at B divided by the volume at A. But if we go back and look at our PV diagram, the volume B is less than the volume A. So this ratio VB divided by VA is less than one. And if you take the ln of something that's less than one, you get a negative number. So this is less than zero. What we said Q was going to represent was the heat added to the system. So if we add negative heat to the system, that means we're releasing heat. So the, the system is releasing heat. So therefore, what we find is that Q2 is less than zero. Therefore, heat is removed from the system or the gas and added to the reservoir. Okay, and so let's schematically show that in our PV diagram, and we'll say that what we're going to do is we're going to take heat out of our system. And so we'll represent that in this way. Okay. Um, so that's fine. Then what we could do is we could say, well, that also means that the work AB, and let's calculate here, I'm going to calculate the work by the gas or by the system. Um, so if du is 0, then dq must be equal to dw, so the work by the system or by the gas is just equal to this heat Q2, and so it's also equal to NKBD, NKBT2 ln of VB over VA. And this is also a negative. Negative makes sense because what we're doing is we're using a piston to compress the gas, so we're actually doing work on the gas. We're doing positive work on the gas, which means that the work by the gas is negative. Okay, good. So that's the first process. The second process is to thermally isolate our system from the surroundings. Another way to put this is to isolate our gas from 
both thermal reservoirs, i.e. isolate gas from both thermal reservoirs. If we do this, then the system cannot exchange any heat with anything, right? It's not in thermal contact with any objects. And so there cannot be any heat released or absorbed by our gas. And so that means that dq is equal to zero. And when there's no heat exchange, that's called an adi adiabatic process. Okay, so our second process is going to be adiabatic. And so schematically, what that might look like is here's our container. It's still closed by a piston. Um, and what we're going to do in this first process is we're going to let the gas expand the piston. So this is going to be an adiabatic expansion. OK, so we have to recall something from adiabatic processes on ideal gases. So recall that for an adiabatic process on an ideal gas, there was this relationship that PV to the power gamma, so it's just the volumes raised to the power gamma, is equal to a constant. And this gamma was related to the degrees of freedom, F. Gamma is F plus 2 over 2. So for example, for our monatomic gas, if F equals 3, then gamma is 5 halves. It's going to turn out to be important that this gamma factor is greater than 1. OK. Um, so if PV to the gamma is a constant, then if we start at pressure PB and volume VB, where we left off after our first isothermal process, and let's suppose then we end at some pressure PC and volume VC, then we must have this relationship. Um, I'm going to do something a little bit funny. I'm going to factor out one factor of volume on both the left and right hand sides of this equation. So we get PV, uh, sorry, PB, VB, and then we have VB to the gamma minus one. And then we'll do the same thing over here. You can see why it's going to be important that gamma is greater than 1 because now we've got these powers of gamma minus 1. So I wanted that power to be a positive power. Okay. All right. But we know that this is just n kPt. n kB where now remember this is not an isothermal process anymore so we started at temperature TB which is at T2 um, but TC could be some different temperature um, so what this relation then implies is that TB VB gamma minus 1 must be equal to TC VC gamma minus 1. All right, so before we go further, let's go back to 
our PV diagram. Where was it? Here it is. Okay. And let's add this process on here. It's going to be an expansion. So we know that the volume is going to have to increase. And these adiabatic processes, let's see if I can get this approximately right. They're going to look something like something like this. Okay, and so we're going to follow this for a certain distance over here. And we're going to go, it's a compression, so we're going from low volume, us. Uh, Sorry, it's not a compression, it's an expansion. So we're going from low volume to high vo volume. And then over here is we're going to end at VC. Okay, so that's what it looks like. And we're going to assume that when we get to the point C, the temperature is at T1. Okay, so we've gone from temperature T2 at point B to temperature T1 at point C. So TB was equal to T2 and let's call TC equal to T1. So that's the temperature T1 is the temperature of our cold thermal reservoir. Okay, good. So what that means then is that we have T2 VB gamma minus 1 is equal to T1 VC gamma minus 1. Or rearranging a little bit, the ratio of temperatures T2 over T1 must be equal to VC over VB to the gamma minus 1. So we know that because we did an expansion, VC is greater than VB, and because gamma is greater than 1, that means gamma minus 1 is positive, and so this ratio of volumes, which is bigger than 1, raised to a positive power, is still bigger than 1. This all implies that T2 is greater than T1, which is what we wanted. T2 was our hot thermal reservoir and T1 was our cold thermal reservoir. Okay, um, the other thing we have to do is we have to consider the change in internal energy. The change in, turn in internal energy is determined by the heat and the work. We said this was an adiabatic process. So we don't have to worry about the heat in this case. And so that means delta U is minus the work, or the work is equal to minus delta U, which is minus internal energy was F over 2 NKBT. So the change in work is the final temperature T1 minus the initial temperature T2. Um, and so therefore the work from B to C now T2 is a higher temperature so T1 minus T2 is negative and then we have a negative out front and so this is overall positive. And so this is work by our system or by our gas. Okay, so we've done uh, two of our processes. Um, we just have two more to do to finish our cycle. We're going to do another isothermal process. This time it'll be isothermal 
with the reservoir, the cold reservoir T1. So now we put our system in contact with the reservoir at temperature T1 and isothermally expand the gas. So we're going to do another expansion. We're doing an adiabatic expansion followed by an isothermal expansion. And so let's go back to our picture over here. And so we need to add another isotherm on our diagram. And so let's see if I can do this about approximately right. So it's going to go through this point C. And this is a T1 isotherm. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to follow this isotherm out to somewhere around here. We're doing another expansion. So this is the direction. And we're going to end up landing at some point uh, D, which is going to be at temperature T1. Okay, so... Um, because it's isothermal, there is no change in internal energy. Temperature doesn't change. And so Q1 is equal to uh, the integral of the work. The work is P dV. Uh, P is proportional to 1 over volume. So we're integrating dV over V. And we get this ln relationship that we had before. And so we would go N K B. T1 ln of Vd over Vc. It's the same calculation we did for the other isothermal process. However, this time, because it's an expansion, volume Vd is greater than volume Vc. And so we're taking the ln of a quantity that's greater than 1. And so this is positive. So that means our system gains energy, heat is absorbed by the system or removed from the T1 or the cold reservoir. T1 reservoir. Um, this is the important part of the cycle because we have extracted heat from the cold reservoir. This is refrigeration. Um, so let's go back to our PV diagram and let's indicate that by saying that heat, I'm kind of imagining that our system is going to be kind of contained by the enclosed area that we're going to have when we finish our cycle. And so this heat Q1 is going into that system or into that enclosed area. So that's heat extracted from the cold reservoir. Okay. Good. Um, so we calculated Q1. The work is equal to the heat because there's no change in internal energy. And so that means the work, well, the work when we go from point C to D is NKBT1 ln VD over VC. This is an expansion. So the gas is pushing on the piston our system is doing work. This is positive work by the gas. Okay, there's only one more part of the cycle and the only purpose of this part of the cycle is to 
return to our starting point. And so this is part four. And we can return to A to complete the cycle by adiabatically um, compressing the gas from a volume VD to a volume VA. Um, it's adiabatic, so dq is going to be zero. Um, and so let's go to our diagram and let's finish it off. So we need another adiabatic line and it's got to go through points A and D. Okay. And so it's a compression. And so we're going from high volume to low volume, like so. And there's our cycle. It's a counterclockwise cycle from A to B to C to D. Um, you probably recognize this as the Carnot cycle in reverse. When you talked about it in thermodynamics, you probably did a clockwise cycle. Um, and you were using an existing temperature difference to do uh, to extract work. Here we've done the opposite. This is the refrigeration cycle, uh, and it's a Carnot cycle. So it's two isothermal processes and two adiabatic processes, one expansion and one compression each. Okay, um, so let me get my black marker back. So in this case, du is equal to dq minus the work, but there is no dq. So that means the work from d to a is minus the change in internal energy and the internal energy is F over 2 and kBT so the final temperature is back at point A which was at T2 and the initial temperature was T1 so this is work by the gas and it's negative because it's a compression what we're really doing is we're doing work on the gas which corresponds to negative work by the gas okay um, so we could calculate uh, sorry Let's let's do one other thing. So like we had previously like we had with the other adiabatic process. We could do this analysis where remember PV to the gamma was equal to a constant. If you do that exactly the same way we did it the first time you get this expression T1 VD gamma to the minus 1 is equal to T2 VA gamma to the minus 1 uh, if you convert that to a ratio of temperatures and a ratio of volumes it's T2 VD over VA to the gamma minus 1 okay good so there's all of our cycles, um, and we've analyzed the heat and work for each part of the cycle for all four processes. It has the uh, 
It has the result that we wanted, that we we're taking heat out of the cold reservoir and depositing heat into the hot reservoir. Because we calculated the work associated with each part of the cycle, we could find the net work that was done when we, when we do one complete loop. So work on the gas. So this is work on the gas. So I'm going to say minus the work by the gas from A to B, minus the work by the gas from B to C, minus the work by the gas from C to D, minus the work by the gas from D to A. And we've done all of these calculations. So this is going to be the net work on gas during one complete cycle. Okay, so we've calculated all these things and if you go back and look them up, you'll find the following results. Uh, and then it's minus n kb t1 ln of v d over vc. This is supposed to be an a here. That's an a. And then we have plus f over 2 n kb t t2 minus t1. This last one is the one we just calculated, right? It's right here. Okay. Um, so one nice thing that happens right away is that if we look at the second and last terms, they're the same except for a minus sign. And so the T2s cancel and the T1s cancel. And so these, the second and last terms just completely wipe each other out. And therefore what we're left with is uh, minus NKB. And then we have a T2 ln of VB over VA plus a T1 ln of VD over VC. Okay. Um, but if you look over here, we have a T2 over T1 is VD over VA gamma to the minus one. However, we found that we had T2 over T1 is equal to, I'm going to put it over here, VD over VA to the gamma minus 1. VD over VA gamma minus 1. If we go back to our other adiabatic process, T2 over T1 is VC over VB to the gamma minus 1. VC over VB, okay? So it's also VC over VB gamma minus 1. So all of these things are equal to each other. The only way that this equality can hold is if VC over VB is equal to VD over VA or rearranging let's see VD over VC must be equal to VB uh, no that's wrong so D over C is equal to VA over VB Okay, so D over C here, I could replace with A over B, for example. Okay, so therefore, um, the work on the gas is equal to minus NKB. And then 
for now, I'll leave the first term alone. Uh, it's ln VB over VA. And then we have plus T1 ln of D over C, but I'm going to write that as A over B. Okay, so if you think back to our first process, uh, the process from A to B, that was a compression. It was an isothermal compression. That means volume A is greater than volume B. So this term here is positive. And this here is negative. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I'm going to write this as minus NKB. Then I'm going to put this as minus T2 ln of VA over VB, right? I flipped the argument inside the ln, which I can do as long as I keep that minus sign out front, plus T1 ln VA over VB. And so finally, we get the answer that we want, that the work on the gas is equal to, let's see, let's write it as NKB, bring the minus sign in front, uh, distribute the minus sign that's out front. So we get a T2 minus T1 ln VA over VB. And all of this is positive because T2 is greater than T1, so that's positive. VA is greater than VB, so this is positive. So the work on the gas is positive. And that's what we said we wanted to do with our refrigerator cycle is we wanted to do work on the system uh, to create and maintain a temperature difference. Okay, so we have at least now designed a system that um, does work on the gas and removes heat from the cold reservoir. This is refrigeration. Um, the last thing that I want to do before signing off is to define a coefficient of performance. So coefficient of performance, and this is usually given the symbol zeta. Okay, so what's the useful part of this cycle? The useful part of the cycle is removing the heat from the cold reservoir. And that heat was Q1. And what we have to put in to the refrigerator to do that is we have to supply the work that we're gonna do on the gas. And so the ratio Q1 over this work defines a, a useful figure of merit. Um, so we want to take out a lot of heat and we want to do as little as little work as we possibly can. So we want this coefficient of performance to be large. We want this coefficient of performance to be as large as possible. So we want to do little work and extract a lot of heat Q1. Um, so we just finished calculating this work on the gas. Uh, it's right here. And we have also already calculated Q1. So recall that Q1 was equal to NKBT1 
ln of vd over vc. Um, but we had this relationship between the ratio of volumes. We could write vd over vc as va over vb. Okay, and so that means Q1 is N KBT1 ln of VA over VB. And if you, the work on the gas that we calculated was N KB, and then it was T2 minus T1, and it was the ln of the same ratio of volumes. And so a lot of this cancels. And what we get is a coefficient of performance that is just determined by this ratio of temperatures. It's the temperature of the cold reservoir divided by the difference in temperature between the hot and cold reservoirs. Okay, um, that's where I'm going to stop for today. This is our coefficient of performance. Um, what we're going to do next time is we're going to show that while this particular refriger refrigeration uh, cycle is conceptually simple, it's a little bit tricky to construct and operate in practice. And so what we're going to do is we're going to design a second refrigeration cycle using the Stirling cycle, which is maybe conceptually a little more challenging to deal with um, for reasons that we'll see, but in practice, it's something that can be built and is built. And uh, so Stirling refrigerators are commonly used to as a first stage as, towards getting to low temperature. Okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye.